In the last installation video, we wrapped up the floor platform, but this time we're moving upstairs. This is part three of four of insulating our garage apartment with rock wool, and it's all about the attic and ceilings. This is the first major step to conditioning the upstairs living space, and clearly we're a little excited about it. Before getting started, I wanted to share an estimating resource we used that left us with just two bags of extra attic insulation out of an entire half semi load. It's a spreadsheet calculator we developed specifically for estimating rock wool and new construction or remodel projects, and it's now available on our website. It's the only thing of its kind as far as we can find, so make sure to check it out if you have any installation projects coming up. We have taken a several month hiatus for finishing the exterior of the house and more of our mechanicals and all of the wall insulation, which our faithful friend Shane has returned to help with a little bit today. He's wrapping up the last of the dormer wall insulation and we're gonna get rolling on the ceiling. It's cold now, we got this insulation when it was hot in the summer, but we've been working on other stuff, so it is now January, and we are ready to get this ceiling insulated to keep some heat in here. The radiant floor is going down in the garage, but it's definitely chilly up here. And the radiant system is burning quite a bit of propane, probably about a hundred bucks a month worth, keeping that garage heated. And we have this big open stairwell though, where all of that heat is escaping through. So let's get started on some ceiling insulation. But first, let's flash back to summertime, just after receiving everything to go over the plan for the attic. This is gonna be a two layer bat installation. On the flat ceiling, we're gonna be putting an R38, nine and a half inch thick comfort bat, followed by a layer of R15, which is three and a half inches thick, but it's a little bit more dense than their typical three and a half inch thick R13. The dormer ceilings, we furred down to accommodate some additional insulation depth. We will just be able to get a single R38 bat in there, the dormers and the slope. If money were no object, I probably would use the same eye joist in the floor platform for the roof rafters, just because it's 14 inches deep and would have allowed more insulation depth. But these angled ceilings only account for like 10, 15%, I think, of the total roof area. So that is a slight design compromise that we had to make there, but we did fur down the rafters with an inch and a half furring strip on all the slope ceilings to accommodate that R38 bat, plus a two inch airspace for ventilation from soffit to ridge vent. One benefit of holding off a little bit was it did allow us to put the sprinkler system in when the fire happened in the fall and we decided it would be a good idea. We didn't have to work around or remove any insulation to get that done. And we also were able to build this attic catwalk, which is going to be key for being able to easily get into and inspect the attic with the insulation staying intact and us not trampling over it and potentially putting a foot through the ceiling. We are doing something a little bit special on the ceiling. You probably noticed these weird looking white boxes that are up there. Those are made from Sega Myrex. It's a vapor control layer and we will be putting that on the entire ceiling and all of the exterior walls. That membrane will allow us to get a blower door test pre-drywall to see the air tightness of the space and correct any issues or gaps that might be in the air barrier. The primary air barrier is our zip sheathing, but the Sega Myrix will be sort of a secondary air barrier. And the cool thing about it is it does not function as a typical polyethylene vapor barrier where there's absolutely no vapor or air transmission. Sega blocks air, but allows vapor to move in one direction. So we're going to do a whole separate video on that to explain this a little bit more. But in order to keep a continuous membrane at the ceiling level, we have to accommodate our light fixtures. So that is what these white boxes are. We made five-sided boxes out of Sega. Again, we'll explain how we did all of this in the Sega video, but that will ensure a continuous layer on the ceiling. This is not quite the manufacturer recommended detail on doing this. They recommend furring down the whole ceiling. We have a number of angled planes that all meet one another and it would present a huge carpentry challenge to make that happen. It's not just as simple as furring down a flat ceiling. So this is the solution that we came up with. We actually borrowed it from a friend who did the same detail on his build and we thought it was a pretty good idea. A little bit more labor, but maybe not quite as much labor as furring down the whole ceiling in a very complex manner. So these boxes are anywhere there is a can light, which there is quite a few of them if you look at the white wires hanging down. So we need to hang boxes over all of those. Most of our can lights will be these halo slim canless down lights. So they're actually only a half inch thick and they are certified as airtight just by themselves. But if we're gonna do the Sega, we wanna just do the belt and suspenders approach and make the boxes. Also, we needed a place to accommodate the driver for these lights. So if we ran the Sega flat to the ceiling and drywall right on top of that, there would be really no place for this guy to live for the wire to come in and this needs to stay up in the ceiling, obviously right up next to the insulation. We'll also have some of these slopable recessed down lights, also from Halo, 
and these have more of a housing on them to accommodate that sloping mechanism. Again, this comes with the gasket, but we still wanted to keep an airtight barrier around this can as well. Another consideration we had when choosing to do these boxes was how the drywallers would impact them when they go to install the sheetrock. The original plan was for them to not cut out any of the lights and I would come back after the fact have my light marked on the floor, shine a laser up to the drywall where that Sega box filled with rock wool would be, and then drill out with a big hole saw. But the more I thought about it, I was like, well, if I have the choice, I'd rather have the drywallers cut all the lights out, have them pre-wired, and that way I can just come up there with a ladder, plug the light in, and it's ready to go. So we got these mounting frames from Halo as well, and I do actually have this one installed in the laundry already because this one does not have to be airtight, but this provides a place for the driver to mount, number one, right there, and a ring for the drywallers to stick their router up and zip around the inside of that, get a perfect hole, and it is ready for a light installation. So the boxes also now protect the Sega from that drywall router bit coming up and potentially puncturing that air barrier, which would not be a good thing. However, once I hung up one room worth of the mounting frames, I realized it was actually more of a pain to get them centered perfectly, hope they don't move, and trust the drywallers not to forget any of them than it was just to come back myself later and drill them out. I used a drywall screw on the floor to mark each light location to make sure that it wouldn't get wiped away in the sea of white dust, and it took no time at all to drill them out with my laser and a hole saw after drywall was hung. So I have a few more boxes to hang up. Elena's downstairs cranking them out on the work table, and then we can get motoring on insulation. Hopefully we can get a good portion of this main living area ceiling done today. That would be amazing. To get these guys mounted, I'll do a little slit where the wires are coming in, and then we're gonna come back afterwards and seal that up with a piece of tape on the inside. Lena already kind of pre-creased where these things need to go. We have these little flanges that are gonna to tape to the main air barrier. And this one more or less holds itself in because of the wires, but I'm gonna put a couple staples in it just to keep it put. Sega does allow the use of staples to staple this stuff up, but they do say it's um, better if you can use their Twinette at their double-sided tape products. However, just a couple staples in these boxes I'm really not worried about. Now, before we put our mounting frame up, I'm gonna totally fill this thing with rock wool, maybe carve out a little cavity for where the driver's gonna have to sit and wire this guy up. We'll be good to go after that. That's, that one's ready. The crew is underway. Look at these professional insulators. Getting some R38 up. Elena's got a sweat going on. This is looking really clean and the Sega boxes are working as designed. We made them five and a half inches deep so we could put a standard piece of R23 in there cut at 14 and a half inches. So that fits in there nice and snug. And then on top, we can still fit a three and a half inch bat. One tricky part about this dormer roof is that there's this flat wall and then an angle that we have to meet. So we have, instead of using a carpenter square every time, set the bevel gauge to the same pitch as the roof. And then we can just sit that on the insulation and use that as a cutting template to get that angle cut correctly. If we just put the bat in square, there'd be a big gap at the bottom. So we just have to cut that so that that end is flush with the wall. All right, well, I didn't get a ton of film when we were working yesterday because we were trying to take advantage of Shane's volunteer labor, but we got a good bit done. We got the whole dormer ceiling over there done. You can't really see it. And then a decent amount of this flat ceiling space. So you can see the R38 first layer. And then over there, we have started with the R15 second layer laid crosswise. The trickiest parts are probably getting it underneath this catwalk and getting that filled appropriately. So we had some fun little techniques we were working out there. And then on this side, it's pretty low headroom as you get closer to the end of that roof. So just being strategic about how far we come out with the R38 before we start piling some R15 on top of it. But overall, we have gotten some systems down and we're gonna get there one bat at a time. I'm definitely glad we built this attic catwalk that makes maneuvering up here much easier. In fact, I'm on my little mechanics scooty cart right now 
to scoot down the attic catwalk. That makes it a lot more comfortable than crawling on your hands and knees, I can tell you that. I will say doing insulation bats in the attic rather than blowing is definitely more labor intensive. It's a lot of measuring, cutting, fitting, making sure that there's no gaps. Blowing would all but eliminate all of that labor. However, I do love rock wool and its properties of fire resistance and how dense it is and how it won't settle like a blowing wood. I really wish they made a blowing rock wool. If that product is out by the time we do the addition, that is definitely something that I would look into. To get started on the back half of this roof here, I'm envisioning a few different pieces that we're gonna make in assembly line process. The first of which being this top of wall insulation that we're putting a bevel on the top to sort of match the plane of the roof. That way our airspace is preserved that one inch or so. You can barely see it, but there is daylight down in there. My camera is not doing a good job at all. But this little block gives us a little bit of top of wall insulation, preserves that airspace, and we do have to cut around. I call this the Amish hurricane tie. They did this before I had the chance to say anything about it. Uh, but it's just a two by six that they nailed the heck out of to the top plate and then nailed the rafter like crazy to it. Was not crazy about that solution, but the inspector okayed it. He said it was fine. And honestly, in, in all reality, it probably has about the same hold down as the little steel bow ties. So that's just a little quick framing tangent. But anyway, we got to make a bunch of these. Started on it a little bit when Shane was here. Got to do probably about 15, 20 more. After we finish all those, phase two, I'm gonna use a full R38 bat. So keep it flush with the bottom of my, our little furring strip here. It'll come up roughly to the same point there and follow that up until we hit our flat ceiling joist that's coming in here. But we'll crank about 30 of those out. And then finally to get up into our attic, start another R38 bat here, remove this two by eight from it and go all the way up to the attic space. The 47 inch bat will get me just into here and that is where my R15 second layer picks up on the top of the attic. That second bat will just run in the rafter bay, probably just past those blue wires and just end there. And then we'll pick up with the flat ceiling insulation like down here and I'll bevel the flat ceiling insulation like this to meet that rafter bay insulation above it. That way we're staying as continuous as possible all the way up through and that R15 second layer can meet my rafter bay insulation on top. If you didn't follow all that, don't worry, I can barely follow it. You'll see what I'm talking about. Let's get to work assembly line cutting all of our pieces. We have now made it past level two. Level three is a little bit more challenging because we got to remove that two by eight from the next piece that's going up there. So it'll be a full bat. It'll go above just above that blue wire. And we got to take that two by eight at the right angle out of it. We're filling in Sega boxes slowly but surely to give ourselves a firm place to measure to. We're making some progress, a little bit sure with two people, but we're making it happen. And as I'm going, I'm peeping my head up, making sure we're maintaining that inch space below the roof deck. We're burning the midnight oil. We got a cat up on the catwalk. She's uh, doing some fire caulking, doing some air sealing on these penetrations in the top plate. Contrary to popular belief, they do not need to be sealed with fire caulk for residences, but little miss someone thought otherwise and she insisted on using it. We've just got a few more gaps there, there, and that will be what I'm calling level three, that second full bat, and that is actually lining up perfectly where I want it to. All right, go ahead and dismount. Fun fact, Elena was named after a Russian gymnast. Oh boy. <laughs> oh my gosh, she made it. And the crowd go wild. She sticks the landing. Ma'am, 
Ma'am, what, what they do you do? have to say about this accomplishment? What do you have to say about this? I'm glad I didn't fall. <laughs> She's glad she didn't fall, complete with the Mason Dixon Acres hat. <laughs> it's a brand new day and I am freaking sore from yesterday. All that overhead work, pushing these bats up, getting contorted in weird positions and like leaning backwards and stuff. So this is definitely not a job that I would want to do full time, but we're making progress on our project anyway. The next step is to do these long, like skinny angled pieces. I guess it's a, it's a shallow angled cut. We'll put one more bat of R38 this way, and then I think I'm gonna stack the R15 on top of that. That way I can make sure the R38 is pushed up properly. Sometimes when you push it up between these ceiling joists, the edges get kind of like mushroomed over, and you have to really kind of make sure it's fluffed and at the full, height that it's supposed to be so that it performs like it's supposed to. I call this the giant wedge. Also, not sure if you noticed my Harbor Freight safety goggles. These were uh, $5 for a three pack. They are key for doing this overhead work. I had safety glasses before. They both fogged up from my respirator, but I also kept getting you know dust and insulation droppings down in the glasses. So the safety goggles, while not the most comfortable thing, are Definitely a key piece of PPE. Oh. The wedge worked quite nicely, actually. I'm really impressed with that. One area I'm paying extra close attention to is my sprinkler pipes because these will be full of water all the time for their whole life. That is part of the reason I ran PEX instead of CPVC, which is the industry standard, because I was not about to take any chances of this piping getting brittle and potentially bursting in the event that it ever froze. But that's part of the reason why I located it where I did in the joist bay, pretty much as low down as I could. It's about two inches from the bottom of the joist. And then I built these airtight sprinkler boxes and they actually have a little piece of insulation tucked up above that elbow in order to keep those things warm. However, they do need to share some air with the room for the sprinklers to actually work. So I'm really not worried at all about those freezing because air from the room will be able to get up into that box. But the rest of the piping is gonna be subject to attic temperatures unless I have it totally encased in insulation. So that is what I'm aiming to do. Anywhere I have piping coming through joists and weaving around in these joist bays, I am making sure that I get insulation all around it. It's getting a little bit darker up here with every piece of insulation we put in. We're slowly filling these bays and the flat ceiling in and then the second layer of R15, this guy right here, is going up as tight as it can against the rafters there and then we'll be building it out this way as we go. It's a lot easier to get these R15 bats up before we fill in these joist bays rather than have to take it all up through the attic hatch at the end, especially in this low headroom area of this ceiling where it's a little bit of a crawl off the attic catwalk to get over here to the right. Definitely getting quite comfortable on the top of a ladder. I've probably scaled a ladder at least, oh, I don't know, 300 times so far and we're not even halfway down the attic. By the end of this, my calves are gonna be complete monsters from climbing these ladders. If there's one skill that you have to learn really well if you're gonna build a house, it's climbing and being stable on ladders because I can't even count the number of times in the project as a whole 
that I have had to come up one of these things. It's It's got to be on the order of, uh, I would say between two and 5,000. And this is exactly why not a lot of folks in the trades are overweight. They're just getting constant exercise in all the little motions of building every day. And there is really no reason to maintain a gym membership if you have a job in the trades. So hold fast if you still believe everything will come around if you go away from me. If I surrender to the wind, baby, I will find a place to find a Up underneath this catwalk is a tricky spot to insulate. So what we're doing is slipping the two second layer pieces, the R15 pieces, up just underneath it. We'll notch it out for these two by fours as appropriate. And then once that's up, we can take R38 up from underneath of it as the first layer. And that kind of pushes it up against the catwalk. Just one of a few tricky situations when it comes to cutting all this bat around complex attic structures. Around this sprinkler box, there was a pipe on either side of the sprinkler box, plus the attic catwalk supports. So in cases like this where it's just really cut up, we're just using scraps and just sort of piecing it. It's pretty much the best we can do. There's no real good way to cut like a full bat around all that. We're burning the midnight oil again tonight. The inspector is coming tomorrow morning for the insulation inspection. Can we get the ceiling done? Time will tell, but we're gonna give it our best shot. Six hours later. Well, it's the morning again, and it was a very late night last night, and we didn't fully get done. But we did get a lot of the way there. There's still just a little bit of this pantry ceiling left to do, and there's the bedroom and the closet. The whole hallway is done, above the bathroom, above all the rest of the rooms, really. And this also has all the R15 on the second layer. Inspector comes in a few hours. I'm gonna crank out as much as I possibly can. Probably not gonna be 100% of the way done, but he really likes us. I think he will give us a pass regardless because he just knows that we're not gonna be taking shortcuts and like putting drywall up with no insulation in our own house. I thought about pushing to another day, but they probably have their, their scheduling set already and I would feel bad if I changed the, the date. So we're just gonna roll with it. As we're finishing out this back ceiling, here are some of the fun situations we're running into. Cutting insulation to fit around all these ceiling joists and rafters. This is a fun one. That's a four ply beam over there in the dark that we gotta squeeze something in there. This is the fun shape that I cut for that guy. The total width is larger than a normal 14 half inch stud bay, so these have to get cut long ways to 16 half inches. Take out that two by six ceiling joist. And then on the other side, here is where I took out for the four ply beam. That's six inches at a 10, 12 pitch. So the nice thing about rock wool is it does let you do this. Like, I don't know if you could do this with fiberglass at all. I'll be honest, I've never tried it. But rock wool cuts kind of like cheese is the best analogy that I can make to it. So you can actually make some of these shapes and get the thing to fit nice and tight.
This is truly a momentous occasion. The very last piece of ceiling insulation going in. I cannot tell you how happy I am to see this because it has been a long time coming and a heck of a lot of overhead work to get to this point. I wish I had a statistic on how many ladders have been climbed in the making of this ceiling insulation, but it's been a lot. I would guess on the order of uh, 2,000, if, if I had to make a, a guess. I mean, it's just a lot of cuts, a lot of pieces. But we are finally here. A little bit of finessing it in there. And there she is. The Rockwool workbench was a bit of a late idea. Elena was using the main workbench, the cutting station, I should say, for some wall insulation that we're finishing up over there. But this turned out to be a great ergonomic setup. Um, I, would, I would recommend it if you have a couple extra bags laying around. Speaking of which, we only have five, three in the front room, eight and change R38 bags remaining. I think there's like 12 on a pallet. So we got the perfect number of pallets and any extra we're gonna put in these little attic spaces, the three little attic spaces kind of between the dormers. And if we have any bats after that, they're gonna just get tossed up in the attic on the north and south sides, kind of the perimeter of the house where the most heat is gonna be lost. We did quite well on the R15 estimate. Also, there is literally just one bag and one single bat in this top bag left over. These two pieces of equipment here were pretty much vital for the overhead stuff. We got away with just the cloth mask for the wall stuff. That's what Rockwool's you know, official recommendation was, just a cloth mask all you need. But the problem is the cloth mask fogs up glasses. So having the half face respirator definitely helped with that. Also is a little more robust in keeping the Rockwool dust out of your mask and out of your mouth. Also does a better job at filtering the air because it does get quite dusty in here when you're putting the stuff in overhead. And the goggles were also a must. I did a little bit of this stuff with glasses, but working overhead, inevitably some dust falls in under the glasses and gets in your eye and that's not very comfortable. So the Harbor Freight uh, $5 for three pair goggles were a huge lifesaver in this job. I'm in the little attic here so I'm handling all the scrap. Of course I'm going to fill these little bays. I ripped these little spacer strips when I thought that I might need to put some foam board here to create my one inch air gap but Luckily the rock wool is rigid enough. I did not need to do that. But obviously I'm gonna fill the rafter bays up with R38, keep the air gap up against the roof. And then in this little triangular portion, I decided to kind of wall it off with insulation. Can't really see it that well in there. There's just a little tiny triangle all the way through to the other attic and I could put some insulation in the rafters there cause it is kind of exposed to open air but I decided I'm just gonna leave that totally unconditioned space down in that triangle. I just really didn't feel like climbing up in there and putting insulation up in the rafters. This is the attic knee wall that's up against that little spot right there, and that's fully insulated with R23. This will be air sealed with Sega Myrex and Fentrum around the window, and even at this bottom joint here, I'll either seal the sill against the subfloor with some Lexel, or use the Sega tape and fold it down onto the subfloor. So there should not be any air leakage to that unconditioned space. Using up the R38 scraps in the attic spaces should at least keep them somewhat temperate for storage. That's one, two, and three attic spaces completely insulated. And that brings us down to just one, two and a half bags of R38 left out of a basically a half a truckload worth of it. That's pretty awesome if you ask me. I think having those attic spaces insulated will help a lot with keeping it temperate in there. And I made sure to keep that inch or inch and a half or so air gap above the bats between the roof decking so that the ventilation from the soffit to the ridge is still continuous and any hot or cold air or moisture can flow up underneath the roof deck into the attic and out the ridge vent. Quick note on the material estimate or takeoff on this rock wall. I had never done an insulation takeoff before, so I really wanted to be careful about how I did that. And of course, like any other takeoff, I made an Excel spreadsheet. I literally counted the number of open stud bays we had, the length of them, calculated it all out, figured out how many bats were in a pack of rock roll, how many packs were on a pallet, sorted that all out in an Excel 
inputable spreadsheet where I could just put my number of bays and stuff in and it would just spit out a total number of pallets that I needed to order and it turned out to be really, really accurate. So I wanna make that available. I will put that insulation calculator on our website if you are going to be ordering rock wool and think that would help you. So that is a wrap on the attic insulation. The ceiling insulation was quite a bit of work and we are talking about it. Would we wanna DIY this again? Answer is yes, actually. It was, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot of hours, a lot of labor, but what gets, what, what gets me doing it ourselves is knowing that no shortcuts were taken in the placing of the bats in the walls and the ceiling, making sure that everything was fluffed appropriately and there's no gaps or things that were covered up that an insulation contractor who's trying to get the job done like in one day or two days might do in order to keep the job moving. Um, they just probably don't have the same attention to detail that we have. Did it take us, I don't know, eight times, 10 times as long? Probably, but you'll never ever be able to access this part of the building again. It's gonna be locked behind drywall and sheathing for the rest of eternity, hopefully. So it was something that I'm glad that we did ourselves to make sure it was done right. And it was definitely something that went quicker with three people. There were several days where we had some help just for that ceiling insulation and it helps just kind of having an assembly line in place. Even on the days when it was just Alex and I, kind of formulating a plan and having an assembly line structure to that plan really makes things go a lot quicker. So if you can make repetitive cuts all at once and then put everything in the ceiling all at once, it makes things go a lot quicker. So we kind of learned that halfway through the project so we weren't as efficient as we could have been and then the other big thing was making a work surface that was ergonomic i really wish we would have done that at the beginning of insulation because that just made things fly by go a lot quicker it was easier on our bodies and more enjoyable to do the work so one piece of advice would be get some sawhorses, a piece of plywood, set it at an ergonomic height and work on that work surface when you're cutting things rather than kind of leaning over and cutting at the height of the bats. Yeah, in general, anything kind of carpentry related where there's measuring, cutting and installing really doesn't even matter what the actual trade is. The labor multiplies more than just per person. I guess to explain it, like the power Putting of two it, people oh, together yeah. is actually m more than just one plus one. Like, yeah. it's hard to explain. No, like, it's like, so if you had one person working on insulating the walls and another on the ceiling, that goes a lot slower than if we both work on the ceiling together. Right, because right. he can be calling out measurements, I'm down there measuring and cutting, and then he's focused on just measuring and placing, and I'm focused on just cutting, and that just makes things a lot more efficient. So right. that, that was very true for insulation. So if you do have insulation on your plate, definitely do it in that way where you're both working on the same task at the mm -hmm. same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Any, anything sort of related to carpentry where there's measuring, cutting, framing, siding, uh, maybe some roofing, like metal roofing or something like that but just another good lesson learned. Um, not, not really the hard way, but you know, just, just a good lesson learned. Thanks for following along with our ceiling insulation saga. We are not done with insulation. The next episode of this is going to be insulating these walls right here around our bathroom, our bedroom. It's not for thermal, it's actually for soundproofing. So we will catch you on the next one with that one. Thanks for watching and we'll see you on the next one.